Welcome to Faith That Works, exploring the changed lives of those living by faith. Your host, Bob McHouston, will spotlight ordinary people who have discovered for themselves a faith that works. Welcome to another segment of Faith That Works. We have with us, uh, again, Alex McFarlane. Alex McFarlane is an apologetics uh, teacher, preacher, uh, also a, uh, an evangelist. Uh, he loves to tell people about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and how he can come in and radically change your life. Uh, he's got a book out uh, right now, uh, Abandon Faith. And I want, uh, Alex, I want you to, uh, man, you've got how many books? Did 17. you say 17 books? i tell you what, right quick, tell me, I don't know, uh, some of the, the ones that, that you have that people are, are really drawn to. Every one of them? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm very, very blessed to be here, and I want to say thank you. Amen, we're so me. glad you're here. Um, probably the book that I guess kind of put us on the map is called The Ten Most Common Objections to Christianity yes. and How to Answer Them. It's kind of an intro to defending the faith. Yes. Ten Most Common Objections. And then we wrote a book called The 21 Toughest Questions Your Kids Will Ask. Uh -huh. And um, with that book, we did a video series with American Family Studios, and it won an award for best curriculum. Congratulations. Praise to, God. To God be the glory. Amen. Um, more recently, wrote a book, and I, I wanted to give you a copy. It's a book called Abandoned Faith. Thank you. And the subtitle really hey. says kind of where my heart is, Why Millennials Are Leaving the Church mm -hmm. and How to Bring Them Home. Mm. So there, there's this attrition rate. Now, well, let me tell you, before I wrote that book, I wrote a book called Stand Strong in College. Yes. Um, I've been doing a seminar around the country for more than a decade, and, and the title was What You'll Hear Your Freshman Year, Preparing mm -hmm. for the Ways That College mm -hmm. Will Challenge Your Faith. Mm -hmm. What You'll Hear Your Freshman Year. My publisher, generally they get to pick the title, so the publisher came up with this title, Stand Strong in College, mm -hmm. and it's written to young people. But the book, the brand new book, Abandoned Faith, is really written to mom and dad. Mm. If you are the parent of a prodigal, and hopefully, more importantly, how not to become the parent of a prodigal. Ah. So we're, we're trying to equip mom and dad so they can equip their kids. And thank the Lord for good youth pastors. Mm. Thank the Lord for good pastors. Thank the Lord for Billy Graham and Josh McDowell and Charles Stanley. We yes. love them all. But I believe that discipleship begins in the home, right. that, that really the, the family and the home is the church in miniature. Mm. And so in turning around this attrition rate... Say that again. Yeah. Say what you just said. The, the home is... The home is the church in miniature. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, really, part of the reason... Let me say this. Um, uh, we've got a, an America that's really different than the America you and I grew up in. Right. All right. For over a hundred years, the um, number of people that do believe in some sort of God is about 96 percent. 96 percent say there is a God. Four percent say there's no God. But in the last decade, that's really changed. And let, let me say um, that we really need to be in prayer because right now of millennials, those that are 30 and younger, Plurals, sociologists um, talk about kids that are 16, 17 and younger are plurals. They've been born since 9-11. Um, those kids have never known an America that wasn't highly pluralistic. Mm. All sorts of beliefs. Okay. Of millennials and plurals, one out of five don't believe in God. And that number is really at about 22, 23 percent. We're creeping toward, now think about it, the millennials are 80 million strong. Mm. By 2020, the biggest part of the American workforce will be millennials, 30 and younger. Mm -hmm. The biggest generation in the history of the country, and almost one out of four says, I don't believe in God. Now, we've seen an America with three, four percent atheism. Madeline Murray O'Hare, you and me right. and our generation. We have never seen an America where at least one out of five and increasingly one out of four don't believe in God. Mm. Now that's a whole different rodeo mm. where there's no God, there's no morality, I don't have to repent, I don't answer to anybody but me. That is a different America than 
well, uh, to paraphrase Dorothy, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Now, right. uh. what, deep down what I believe is what this represents is opportunity. We got to pray, we got to evangelize, but what it is for mom and dad, and frankly many of us in the pew, um, this is an opportunity to drill down deeply and to really get our hands on Christianity all over again. Mm. We need to reassert what we believe so we can pass it on to a world that needs to believe. Wow, wow. Now, a millennial is 1982 on? No. Yeah, and, right? and younger, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and younger. Yeah, right now you could say millennials are um, 18 to 30 years old, okay. right in there, okay. about 18 to 30. Okay. And sadly, now, and I, I don't mean to be doom and gloom because no, ultimately okay. we've got some good news, but um, of those raised in church, um, somebody watching might say, well, Alex, wait a minute, my, my kid is in youth group. My child goes to Christian school. But look, three out of four of even evangelical kids will have some sort of faith crisis or spiritual dry spell after high school. Mm. There's this, the, the, we call it the lost decade because it's like graduation from high school is graduation away from God. Yeah. They go away to the university and they uh, question their beliefs. Maybe they, uh, well, and there's four reasons. Okay, from the book Stand Strong in College, there's basically four ways that the college years will challenge your faith emotionally, socially, academically, and spiritually. Mm. And, and I've had so many young people, I'll do a seminar in a church and they, they come back and they'll say, uh, you know, Mr. McFarland, it's exactly like you said. Thank you so much because you gave me a heads up. Sort of give me a little wake up call. I got to college and it's just like you said, emotional, social, spiritual, and academic. And um, you know, kids, they go away to school if they don't understand the concept of accountability, mm. if, if they don't understand that all of life is stewardship, I mm. mean, really. What are you going to do with what God has equipped you with? Yeah, right? exactly. So yeah. to me, uh, I think the most exciting thing in the world, the greatest adventure, the greatest thrill ride in the world is the journey with Jesus. Amen. And we need to tell kids, look, don't come to me when you're 30 with all sorts of baggage, with all sorts of wounds, emotional, spiritual guilt, if not STDs. Yeah. Make a decision now, preemptively draw a line in the sand and say, look, I'm not going to be part of the body count of mm. the casualties of spiritual warfare. Mm. I'm going to make a decision to walk with Christ and I'm going to be a 20-something, an adult, and I'm not going to be one of the casualties. I'm going to be one of the ones that stand strong mm. for Christ. Mm. That's mm. the message we've been sharing. I do a seminar called Raising Godly Kids in a No-Rules Culture. Yeah. Parents love it. Kids respond too. Mm. And that's what uh, that book is mm. about. Mm. Now, now, are you traveling around doing these seminars? Tell, uh, you know, briefly, tell us, I mean, Lord's got you busy, man. Uh, I mean, well, when I say busy. He's got you doing his work, yeah. Uh, but he's he's equipped you uh, with uh, the gifts to put this stuff in writing. Sure. So because, you know, I read a lot of evangelism uh, ways and methods and books and and, and things, but uh, from what I've seen in, in your work, uh, you bring very practical things to life in where, just like millennials, where they are, mm -hmm. how they got there. Yeah. Uh, and, but not only this, pretty much across parenting. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 check out his website. It is uh, alexmcfarland.com. Com. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, thank, well, thank so, you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, wealth of information on there and a great website. Very easy to get along, uh, get, get through it at all, also okay. as well. Um, what, one of the things that, that I wanted to ask you is, uh, the, the generation, the millennial generation, uh, what kind of things, what kind of things that the culture has, that we have in our culture, uh, let's say that they grow up with, sort of let them away. Oh, from, great question. Yeah, let them away from, even, even though if they go to church every Sunday, mm -hmm. what kind of things have led them 
away from, from relationships. Well, you know that? That, that's a profound question. And what I'm about to say is, is far and away going to be the most significant thing I can say tonight. And, and I would pray everyone listening, Amen. try to get your mind around what I'm about to say. Okay. Um, kids today are what sociologists call digital natives. Uh, they've never known a world that wasn't wired up, internet, mobile devices. So uh, they, they've been online since they were born, really, you know. Yeah. And so that, that's really, on the one hand, I, th I mean, it can be a good thing. I mean, you can, um, on the internet, you've got the Library of Congress at your fingertips almost. You know, yeah. you can yeah. Google everything from the Wright brothers to how to make chicken cordon bleu. Mm. But there's a lot of bad stuff on the internet too, as everybody knows. But um, I honestly think we get addicted to technology almost like in previous generations, junkies got addicted to drugs. Right. I mean, study after study, kids cannot be um, separated from their mobile devices and from social media. And they have withdrawal and they, they um, endorphins and the rush of a fix is almost like the rush they feel when they get to habitually you know, a thousand times a week. And I mean, literally a thousand times a week, they're checking their social media. Mm. Now, all of that to say this, how does that mitigate against Christian commitment? Let me say this. When you and I were growing up, you and I had a mindset of fact versus error, true okay. or false, right. guilt or innocence, mm -hmm. all right? Um, I remember when I was a young Christian, you know, I'm reading um, my Bible and I'm reading Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. One of the best-selling books in the 70s and 80s among young people was Josh's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Mm. Kids today don't care about evidence. Uh, I mean, seriously. Yeah. Now, it's important that we know our stuff, but I can be at a university and I can say, look, here's the historical proof of the resurrection of Christ. Um, we've got the Bible, plus we've got Jewish, Greek, and Roman sources. I'll give you, for instance, within 150 years of the life of Julius Caesar, 10 sources reference Jesus. Within 150 years of the life of Jesus, 42 secular sources reference Jesus. Jewish, Greek, and Roman. We have four times more evidence for Jesus besides the Bible than we do for Julius Caesar. Mm. Kids are like, big deal. Now, I want to tell you why. And this is huge. This is huge. You and I, our perspective was true or false. Mm -hmm. Their perspective is shame versus honor. Mm. Kids don't care if something is true or false, largely. What they care about is belonging, shame versus honor. And missions uh, experts, missiologists would have called it tribalism. In other words, the highest core value for a millennial and younger is to belong. In fact, that's why kids, if they get shamed on social media, you do something, you step out of line and we'll flame you, we'll shame you, kids commit suicide mm. because not belonging is um, tragedy to them. Now you and me, mm -hmm. I, I, I have just met you today. Mm -hmm. I like you already. <laughs> but chances are you and me in our high school, somebody disagree with me, big deal. I don't care, mm -hmm. you know. But that's not how kids are today. Um, belonging is the highest value. And the mm. worst fear is to be shamed. That's mm. why even Christian kids will go along with things deep in their heart they know are, are wrong mm. because they don't want to be shamed or ostracized from the tribe. Mm. They are not thinking true or false. They're thinking shame versus honor. Mm. Now, that is a huge, huge cultural yes, shift. Yes, yes, because so, acceptance, approval. Yes, acceptance, significant security. So yeah. you might say, well, how do we overcome that? Because on the evidential side, God, the Bible, Jesus, we've got the evidence. How do I reach somebody who's really not looking for evidence? They're looking for belonging. Mm. Well, it's relationships. Mm. Now, and, and we could do a week of shows about this. Mm -hmm. Why are kids concerned more about belonging than about what's right and true and good? It's because 
almost 70 percent will not live under the same roof as mom and dad together. Yeah. People ask me, they'll say, liberalism, Darwinism, um, secularism, that's what's created this ocean of unsaved youth. Yeah. That's part of it. The biggest thing, the biggest contributor to the 80 million, one out of four who don't believe in God is the breakdown of the family. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I'll say this, and, and I know I've <laughs> talked too much. It's okay. You. No. If the Lord were sitting right here with us tonight, and if Jesus said, Alex, give me any request, I'll do it. Name it. It's yours. I would say, Lord, restore the family. Amen. Amen. If I, this, this is the answer. And if, if anyone listening says, I care about the gospel, I care about young people, I care about the future of America, then yeah. I would say this, become a champion Amen. for the family. Amen. Amen. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. And, and, you know, as you say that, I think about the single mom that's out there, husband left. And, but, you know, and that's where the church has got to step up. Yeah. I mean, you got men in church that need to take a boy that uh, the single mom's in there. She's, you know, she's plugging yes. after it and trying to get after it. And do you feel like it's, I mean, it's our responsibility as, as fathers to pray about and say, you know, how can we take this boy into our home? But that's discipleship and, and mentorship anyway. And, and modeling. Right? And, and let me say to the single parent, and the, the millions of single moms that are valiantly, they're working hard, yeah. they're, they're doing right. Yeah. God bless you. Amen. We, we applaud, we, we will advocate for you. But we do need, uh, for generations moving forward, we need to rebuild the family. Amen. And we I need agree. men to be the men of God. Mm -hmm. uh, Exodus 13, the Word of God says, when it comes to pass that your son will ask you, why do we do these things? Mm. Then you will say, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, God with a strong hand delivered us. Mm. Look, the implication of Exodus 13 is that the son and child will say to the dad, how do I have what you've got? Mm. You know, men, we've got to man up mm. and thank God for godly men, thank God for godly women. Mm -hmm. But really, we need... Um, just a countless multitude of men to say, I will be a man for Jesus. I will be true to my spouse. I will be a man of integrity. I will be a man that lays down his life for my Lord. I don't care who's watching, but my kids will see in me authenticity. Mm. And mm. frankly, we got to, you know, let's be honest. Um, the godly manhood in our generation wasn't always there, was it? No, it was not. It was not. It was not. It's, uh, you know, individualism. It's, uh, you know, you can look back and you can see the John Wayne era. It was that tough guy. He worked, you know, and, and so a lot of what you see wasn't there. But, uh, you know, we grew up, well, actually, in with our father sort of like that. Now, I don't want to dishonor my father. I love my father as, as well as, as you do. But, you know, the truth is uh, that uh, our model is in the scriptures. Our model is is God and how He demonstrated His love toward us and while we were yet sinners. Amen. And uh, and, and and let me say this: mm. um, our our experiences with our earthly father deeply shape our view of the heavenly father. Amen. Yes. And, and I think there's a lot of kids that um, they've got no interest in God or they, they have, you know, God kind of at arm's length mm -hmm. because of some negative residue from their earthly father. Yes. And, and what I always say is I'll say, look, um, if, you had, if you had a less than ideal family situation, yeah. if, if your um, home life growing up is something you'd just as soon forget, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. But look. Uh, don't miss the Heavenly Father mm. who is the perfect parent. Yes. God loves yes. you. He will never abandon you. Yes. He will never forsake you. He will never mislead you. Um, there, there is, there's so many verses we could quote, right. but I love um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. This mm -hmm. says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Yes, amen. God is that faithful friend 
Yeah. Uh, he'll love you. He'll guide you. He'll provide. He'll comfort. He'll do everything. Mm -hmm. He will lay down his life and die for you. In fact, yeah. he did. Amen. Amen. To give us not only everlasting life, but abundant life. Amen. Absolutely. You know, uh, before we came on, uh, Alex and I were talking, and uh, one of the things that came up, and this, this is one of the most astounding things when I begin to really, when we wrap our minds around it, that when God demonstrated that love toward us in, 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 in context with what, what Alex is saying here, there's a word in Scripture in some of the, uh, uh, the translations, and it's a word called propitiation, that, which means God's wrath is satisfied. In other words, you know, when He calls us and, and, and we answer that call uh, uh, to salvation and we accept that love that He demonstrated in His Son, Jesus, and we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead. We repent, we turn, and, and we want that gift. The Scripture says that basically God in His character and His attributes looks at His Son, Jesus, and he looks at all your past and everything that you've ever felt like you could never be forgiven for. And he looks at it and he says, I'm satisfied. Mm. In other words, you know, I know people that come through counseling and they'll say, yeah, but I just, I, you know, I feel like I just got to keep, I got to keep, you know, there's something I got to do and I've got to, you know, really think about it at salvation level or at regeneration or when that moment, when it happens, He's looking at his son, and the scripture says he adopted you. Mm. Now, let me ask you, you know, we've been talking about uh, acceptance, uh, approval. How much more acceptance do you need than that? There's not a world out there or a person out there that can offer you anything. That is the love of a father that you're talking about, right? Mm. Exactly, Amen. exactly. You know, That's, um, uh, <laughs> About two years ago, I was on Interstate 40 uh, in western North Carolina, and I got pulled over. And I didn't know why I was getting pulled over, but it was because I didn't have a seatbelt on. And in North Carolina, you've got to wear a seatbelt or they'll give you a ticket. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I talked to the officer, and he, um, you know, I explained my seatbelt was really dirty, and it gets mm -hmm. my shirt greasy, and anyway, but I'll wear it from now on. He said, okay, here you go. Here's the ticket. $162.50. I was like, yeah, $162.50. So anyway, um, on the back, you can go to court, you can contest it, or you can call, and you can pay it with a Visa or MasterCard. True story. And I think this is an illustration of what you talked about, propitiation. Mm -hmm. So I called the toll-free number a day or two before my court date, and I had my MasterCard out. And uh, I said, I've got a ticket. I didn't wear my seatbelt. Here's the citation number. And I can hear the lady typing it in, like a 10-digit number. And she goes, huh, she goes, tell me that number again. And she types it in again, and she goes, um, your ticket has been paid. And I said, now what? And I felt conviction, I really did. I said, now I wasn't wearing my seatbelt, and I owe this. She said, listen, I can take your credit card number. You can pay this, or you can accept that somebody's paid it for mm. you. Mm. She said, I don't know who went in the system. And, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe the policeman heard me on the radio and was mm -hmm. a fan. Or, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, she said, will you accept that your ticket has been paid? Mm. And very guilty, I, I said, yeah, and I thank, thank you. What we're saying to the world is, look, your ticket mm. has been paid. Mm. Jesus paid your Amen. ticket. Oh. And mm. he is as close by as a prayer, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, that is such a beautiful illustration and example. And, and thank you, Alex. You know, the thing is this is, I mean, we're talking about generation of kids, generation of people growing up and going off to school and going off to college, and they're looking and they're trying to find a relationship and they're, 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 or they're, they're bypassing relationship. Mm -hmm. Salvation in, in Christ is that. I mean, it, it is the relationship, and we take that relationship as new, and He makes us new creations. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that, as, as I've seen, you know, as, as what we've been talking about, 
you know, we, we have a, a, a and, and it's not just millennials, it's, it's adults, you know, way back. We text, we text, we text, we, but we don't communicate. Mm -hmm. You can go to a restaurant, sit at a restaurant and sit down in the, the, yeah. And, uh, or it was funny. I was watching one of my sons at the mall one day. I'm just hanging out with my buddies. Yeah. And I'm sitting in the mall. I'm looking at a big table, and they're all sitting around. They're not even talking to each other, Thumb but they're but they're hanging out. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So, you know, and and it makes sense. You know, the relationship is the evidence of Christ in me. You know, working itself out, loving one another, serving one another, denying self. What can I do for you? What? But if if I if I'm communicating. Just by text, just by social media, I can cut you off anytime I want to cut you off. Amen. That's yeah. not relationship. I can stop anytime I want to stop. Yeah. Well, I can act like my phone went dead. <laughs> yeah, I want to give parents two words. Yes. Stewardship and boundaries. Amen. Stewardship for okay. the Christian in, in 1 Corinthians uh, six nineteen and twenty. Paul said. Don't you know that you're not your own, you're bought with a price? Yes. See, we're not owners. We are owned yes. by the Lord. And so for the Christian, all of life is stewardship. Our, our time, our mind, our behavior, you know, what we do with our bodies, you know, God owns us. So we're, we're not owners, we're stewards. And we need to be faithful and remember that God is, is the owner. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is boundaries. And when I do my seminars, I, I get parents. I say, repeat after me, I am the parent. Say it like you mean it. Yeah. I am the parent. Now, you know the golden rule. The one who has the goal makes the rules. Yeah. Mom and dad, they'll say to me, but Alex, oh, my eight-year-old, if I, if I limited computer time, if I limited screen time, they would be so angry. Yeah. Like, so? Yeah. So? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you've only got this little itty bitty window of time, 18 years. Now, um, to young people, I talk about the decisions we make that shape the trajectory of our life. But mom and dad, you've got this little window of time and you've got mm. to set boundaries. Uh, you write the check. <laughs> you pay the bills. Mm. You have every right to limit um, mm. technology, set boundaries. The, we're going to have family quiet time. And we're going to have a meal. Uh, we're going to have an unplugged meal mm -hmm. together. <gasps> 20 minutes without checking my mobile device. Yeah. So set boundaries, keep stewardship, pass the faith. You know what, Alex? Yeah. You have blessed us. You, I know you're blessed. And, and, and I'm challenged. As a matter of fact, I've got conviction running all over me right now. Some of the things that, that, that I will tell you that, that, I, that I need to change in my own home. Listen, I challenge you to do that. Because it is our call as a parent. I mean, evangelism, discipleship starts right at the home. And that's the whole message. Here's the book, Abandoning Faith. Check out his website, alexmcfarland.com. Thank you for watching A Faith That Works. Help support Faith Ministries by getting your car washed. Bob's Mobile Car Wash will come to you. All proceeds help the ministry to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Call us today. 205-336-7000.